Well, good morning, everyone. I am uh, Jason Grumet with the Bipartisan Policy Center. It is a pleasure to welcome you to today's event, which is posing the question, is there a bipartisan solution for liability concerns? Without burying the lead, uh, we are here to argue that the answer to that question needs to be yes. We know that this is a complicated challenge, um, but it is one that we believe is going to have to be resolved in the same spirit that Congress has come together over the last six to eight weeks to address what is really, I think, an unprecedented set of challenges. Um, and we are gonna to spend today trying to explore what those lanes look like uh, with folks who can help us really think through some of the big picture political issues, as well as some of the real nuances and challenges for how we balance, I think, the uh, shared ambition to reopen the economy in a way that is safe, that protects workers, protects families, protects businesses, and recognizes that the economic deprivation is itself a tremendous public health challenge. Um, this uh, conversation is part of a series of discussions that the BPC is having about reopening America. Uh, I think there is a blog uh, that we have shared in the chat feature that just kind of puts this in context, but we believe that there are a half a dozen critical challenges that the country is going to have to grapple with to navigate this tension of how we restore economic strength to the country in the midst of this terrible public health crisis. Uh, we are focused on issues around availability of testing. BPC is focusing on questions around childcare, recognizing that that is an essential industry that needs to be ready for people to return to work. We're looking at a number of issues around incentivizing the return to work as the unemployment insurance uh, starts to transition towards the inflection point of how we bring people back into the office, what kinds of incentives are going to be necessary for frontline workers and child tax credits and earned income tax credits. We're thinking a lot about questions around how we support working families, and we're thinking about these issues around business liability. So for us, this is part of that much larger conversation that the country needs to have. Um, you know, this was an issue that was um, bipartisan before it became partisan. Reminds you of uh, voting for it before you voted against it. But I think that uh, the country has a history at moments of crisis to try to, in a very particular way, focus on precise limited ways in which ensuring that people who are trying to do the right thing are not punished for that. Um, but as the conversation in Congress has moved from just the emergencies around subsistence to this question of recovery, core ideological political issues have started to kind of take more of a hold on the discussion. And so we are trying to have a solution-oriented conversation today that, as we say, is mindful of but not captive to the generational struggle between defense bar and trial lawyers around broader issues about liability and recognize that the conversations that we're trying to have today focused on this critical pandemic could have precedential effect, right? So we're not naive to the notion that we can have this conversation separate from that broader conversation. But at the same time, we're trying not to become victimized by what we understand is going to be a constant struggle in this country to think through the appropriate way to structure business liability law. Um, we have two panels today. The first panel is gonna focus on a little bit of the bigger picture, talk through some of the politics and start to think about how we kind of frame and unpack the issues. Uh, second panel led by my colleague, Michelle Nellenbach is gonna drill down a little more onto some of the issues and concerns facing local business. We will have opportunities for interaction with uh, the several hundred of you uh, Zooming in, um, I think that uh, many of you, this may not be your first Zoom rodeo, but there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And at any time you are able to type a question, we have uh, some fleet-footed staff who are gonna be sorting through those. And hopefully I will be able to ask uh, several of those uh, on behalf of the audience. We're gonna spend about 25 minutes or so in a discussion, then go into Q&A, and then we'll do that again for the second panel. So to kick us off, uh, we are starting this panel off with two people who I think of as uh, proud and pragmatic partisans, John Delaney and Michael Steele. Um, Michael Steele, as you know, was Lieutenant Governor of Maryland from 2003 to 2007. During that time, he showed a lot of leadership on issues relevant to today's conversation about small business, economic renewal, public education. Um, Michael was the chair of the RNC from 2009 to 2011. Well, he's one of the most humble people I know. If you press him, he will remind you that he picked up 63 seats that cycle. So, um, you know, again, Michael knows how to, how to be a harsh partisan when the moment calls for it. He is a faculty fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute for International Public Affairs. He is most known to you all as a, a pundit, an MSNBC analyst who uh, graces many of your living rooms, uh, I think, on a regular basis. 
And most important to Michael and certainly to me, he's a member of the Bipartisan Policy Center Board of Directors. So uh, good to have the home team uh, with us on the call today. John Delaney uh, was the representative of Maryland's sixth district from 2013 to 2019. Uh, in his time on the Hill, uh, we had great opportunities to work with Congressman Delaney on infrastructure, economic development. He was a real leader on issues addressing the opioid crisis. Um, John was uh, rated the 53rd most bipartisan member of the Congress uh, by uh, our partners at the Luger Center. So, you know, top, top 10, you know, I mean, I, Certainly not, uh, not on the edge, but you know you definitely uh, got some good bipartisan creds there, which we're going to take advantage of as we try to have a truth-telling conversation here in the next few minutes. But um, I think in some ways, uh, John's expertise here comes as much from this time before Congress as his time serving the country. He is an entrepreneur, a serial innovator, and a business leader. John started two publicly traded companies that provide capital to literally thousands of small and mid-sized businesses. And so he's thought a tremendous amount about what it means to grow, start, and sustain a business, which is, I think, a lot of what we're going to be talking about here in a little bit. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, um, John went on a little bit of a focus, a lot on 99 counties, a square state in the country, and uh, spent a lot of time basically just kind of listening to Americans as he was uh, contesting for the Democratic presidential nomination. And so it's also hopefully that kind of broad sense you have about just what the spirit and challenges are that face the country that we're going to draw upon today. So with that drum roll, let me, um, let me start out and maybe put a question to you, um, Michael, first. And just how should Congress think about just approaching this challenge of encouraging economic recovery while protecting workers and customers? I mean, just what's the goal? What are we trying to achieve in this exercise? Well, I think that's, first off, uh, thank you. Uh, I think this is a, a great forum for this uh, discussion at this time. And it's very important and relevant, particularly as the economy starts to open up and now all 50 states are engaged in some form of opening up and reopening their economies. That question is a, a, a seminal one. It's an important one uh, because it requires us to sort of, in our governments to sort of look at uh, not just holistically, but really in a focused way on how they strike that balance between opening up the economy uh, and protecting workers, not just their physical well-being, but as well, but their economic well-being as, as, as well. And so that's a big part of the challenge you're seeing right now um, states have to, uh, to confront. How do we reposition businesses so that they are comfortable, quite frankly, uh, reopening. Uh, employers are capable and comfortable of returning to work. Uh, and then how do we begin to address some of the, what will become problematic issues uh, like ensuring that safety, protecting and, and maintaining uh, that economy uh, longer term? particularly in the face of a potential resurgence of coronavirus in the winter, late fall or winter, what that will do. So you see right now this, this um, engagement at the state level and, and, and tangentially at the federal level of looking at, okay, so what exactly are we talking about here? What does it mean? And what it's gonna require, which is why this conversation is important to sort of point this out, is getting beyond the sort of partisan noise that seems to have crept into the healthcare uh, discussion uh, from tainting and corrupting the economic discussion. Um, Senate Republicans are, are now sort of pulling back, reserving a little bit in spending more money as Democrats are pressing forward uh, in a new stimulus package to put an additional $3 trillion into, into play and the space in between is where the federal leadership is gonna to have to come around this issue of not only providing the capital, the resources, but then protecting that, ensuring that those resources are actually sustainable longer term so that on the back end, you don't have to find yourself, you know, with another three, four, $5 trillion expenditure because you didn't protect and you weren't smart about putting in place those safeguards up front. You're, you're signaling something I want to talk about a little bit, which it does seem like there is a growing symmetry between the call for targeted, tailored, and temporary state aid and targeted, tailored, and temporary business protection. And so I think uh, hopefully our Congress sees that uh, 
calibration potentially as well. Um, John, so you were a small business owner before you became a big business owner, right? Which is a sign of uh, you know, the American dream. Um, how do you think about the challenges, particularly as they face kind of small businesses trying to grapple with these decisions about what to do over the summer? First of all, Jason, uh, thank you for having me. And it's uh, the work that you do at the Bi Bipartisan Poli Policy Center has never been more important than it is now. And it's great to be with my good friend and fellow Marylander, Michael Steele. So Michael, it's, it's fun to be on this panel with you. Hopefully we'll be able to do it in person at some point. Yes. So I, I think we have to think about our standard, Jason. Our standard isn't to be um, reckless. Our standard isn't to be too cautious. Our standard is to be responsible. And I think most small business owners really do think responsibly, right? They're connected to their communities, they're connected to their customers, and they want to ensure that their uh, employees are safe and their customers are safe. And I think they're doing what so many of us are doing, which is looking at the facts and looking at the data and trying to make informed decisions. When this started several months ago, no one knew exactly how it would play out. We had almost no information. We were in many ways completely surprised by this. Everyone was. The White House was, the Congress was, the business community was, the stock market was, no one saw this coming. And we had very limited information and we did the right thing, which is we were prudent, we shut down to allow our healthcare system to, to stand up the capabilities needed. But we've learned a lot in the last several months. We've learned who's vulnerable, who this affects, We've learned a lot how it spreads, how it doesn't spread. And while there's a lot to learn, we have in fact seen a lot of data. And so we got to get back to this notion of like not second guessing ourselves all the time and trying new things and recognizing that we may have to pivot and we will make mistakes and, and make changes. And I think that's how we have to think about businesses. I mean, what's, what's hit small businesses in this country is like nothing anyone could have ever imagined. You know, because of government actions, most of them were forced to be closed. And we've got a very concerned and anxious and scared country. And, you know, small businesses are going to have to navigate that. And they, they're, they're opening around this country. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. More will be opening. They need some clear rules of the road to follow. And they have to do their best to follow those rules. Mm -hmm. And if they do, you know, we have to give them some latitude. And I think that's how we've got to look at it. I mean, the only way to manage uncertainty is with data. And we actually have some data. That data should be incorporated in some state-based and local-based rules and regulations. And businesses should follow those. And, they should, and if they do their best efforts to follow those, we can't be second-guessing their decisions. Talk a little bit about the, the politics of this, because this is the, the panel that's supposed to help us Kind of center this as a serious conversation that does not get lost to the tragedy of the edges. Um, and let me start, I guess, with you, John. You know, your old home team, the new Democrats, right? The kind of business minded Democrats, we're having pretty active conversations about this with the business community. And then the majority leader said, This is my red line. And it seemed like then all of a sudden, all of the urgency around this issue had started to become much more partisan. How do you think about ways to? address issues that are specific to this crisis that does not call in all of the precedential anxieties about bigger arguments about the country has been through Y2K, 9-11. I mean, there are some examples of having these kinds of very targeted approaches. Do you think it's possible to do something that is targeted that does not, in fact, spill over to the entirety of this very tough debate? Absolutely. Everything should be targeted right now. Right. I mean, we should be doing things that, that are dealing with the issues that the American people and, and businesses are facing and healthcare systems are facing and state and local governments are facing based on COVID-19, period, end of story. That should be our focus. We've got a lot of other issues in the world and in our country that many of us fight, spend a lot of time fighting for. Those shouldn't creep into this conversation too much because it makes it very hard to make the kind of progress we need. And I think there's a deal to do on a variety of things. You know, I, I used to say in business, the best business deals are ones where everyone feels a little bad when they're done. And I think that's what we're going to have here, right? I mean, this you is- You just started day in the life of the Bipartisan Policy Center. So thank you. Thank you for that. 
And that's kind of the issues we're going to have here. I mean, I do think there's space to provide some targeted relief. Now, we got to understand what the role of the federal government is on this stuff. I mean, a lot of this stuff is, in fact, governed by states and local government. But it seems to me there's a role for the federal government here, just like there's a role for the federal government to support state and states and local governments, which I know is important to Speaker Pelosi. Uh, and so you could see how these things start getting woven together in whatever the next relief bill does, just like what you talked about earlier, which is we have to shift from supporting people who are not working to, to also creating incentives for people to work. So you could also see some kind of a deal where something like the earned income tax credit is combined with maybe one more stimulus check, you know, to, to help people right now, but also encourage people to get back in the workforce. So you could see a lot of different deals coming together um, on a lot of these issues in a focused way. So Michael, you know, spend a little time Svengalian kind of Republican politics on this for us. I think there's obviously been a concern raised that by trying to create some kinds of shields or safe harbors, it's going to create an incentive for irresponsible behavior. It's going to create anxiety among the you know courageous men and women who are our frontline workers who are going into work every day to make it possible for us to have health care and food and all the rest of the things right. that we're all enjoying. How do we make sure that there's not an overreach? And how do we make sure that it stays kind of targeted to a, a crisis? Well, not just uh, smart policy, but smart politics, uh, understanding those dynamics and, and the various constituencies that are impacted by federal decisions um, is, is a big part of how all this comes together. When you look at the last stimulus, what was one of the takeaways by and large by small business owners? Well, we didn't get the full brunt of the benefit. Uh, a lot of the larger companies uh, that didn't need the money got the stimulus money, if you will. Uh, and so the politics in, out of STEM 3 was not good politics um, in terms of where Republicans were making uh, an economic argument. The visual, if, if not the reality, uh, said something very different to the vast majority of Americans. So as they get ready for this next round, and you're looking at uh, concerns around liability issues, you're looking at concerns around uh, being able to sustain the economics of this, the smart policy is going to require you to uh, the point that John just made about what, what a good business deal looks like and having done good business deals and you walk away feeling, oh man, God, that hurt. <laughs> when everybody in the room saying that, then you know you've pretty much got it right because that requires a little bit of pain all the way. A lot of our politics right now seems to avoid pain for certain classes of individuals. And in this environment, we can't afford to do that. We all have a shared interest in the recovery, not just of our economy, but of our health, not just of our health, but of our economy. So if we have that as a bottom line understanding going in, that in order, it's like going to the doctor. Yeah, you know, the castor oil sucks. You're gonna have to drink it once a day or twice a day in order to get better. Um, the same is true on the economic piece you know, whatever those tools are going to be, you're going to have to go through it together. So small business owners who have felt a big part of this pain uh, are going to have to find some relief uh, somewhere in this. And so their concern right now, when you've got 70% of small business owners concerned about being liable on the back end of this. So everybody's telling us to open up. Okay, great. We opened up. Someone comes into my restaurant, someone comes to my bar, to my salon, you know, to get their hair done or whatever, and they get sick. May or may not be directly linked to me, right? But they came into my establishment because you asked me to reopen. Where does the liability end? Where does it begin? So answering those types of questions, both on the policy and the political side, become very important. So when you start the conversation by drawing red lines, then all of a sudden people are going to go to a defensive political position. And, and I think it becomes an easy argument for your opponents to make that you're only interested in caring for and taking care of a particular class of individuals. Even though you say you're for the, for the little guy, your policy seems to be and your rhetoric seems to stop at the edge when it comes to benefit the smaller mom and pop individual. So reconcile, reconciling that politically for Republicans, I think is going to be important right now. Uh, and how they do that will require them, quite honestly, uh, to maybe erase some of those red lines 
and and feel a little bit of that pain um, that that everyone else is feeling for their guys as well as the little guy. I want to talk a little more about the the workers. I should just note that. Um... Your invocation of castor oil was was metaphor. That was not an actual particular proposal or endorsement of any particular product. No, it was not. I just had a flashback to my childhood having to take and castor oil. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the role of the federal government. I think you raised the point that ultimately, when it comes to liability, this is usually a state's issue, and there are some federalism concerns that we need to think about. Um, but what could the federal government, what should the federal government be doing in terms of trying to set some standards? I think, John, you said, look, and I've heard this from the small businesses and the local chambers we've talked to, tell me what to do. I want the CDC, I want OSHA, I want, I want everyone to tell me what to do, and I want to know that if I do that, I'm okay. I mean, that feels like if there was a singular kind of emotion that threaded through this discussion, could the federal government, should the federal government be doing more to kind of set up those standards? I know the CDC has put out some guidance recently, but how critical a piece of that is the federal government's responsibility to create that framework against which people's actions can be judged? Well, I think it's very important. I mean, the CDC did just, in fact, put out 60 pages of guidance. I haven't looked through them, but, but that's an important step. So I think, you know, the one thing about our country, as we know, is we have urban areas, we have rural areas, we have suburban areas. There's going to be some different things that are needed depending upon uh, what's going on in the local community, at least for the near term. But I think you start with a set of clear regulations or guidelines from the federal government around the things the federal government can speak to, recognizing they can't speak to everything. And then you overlay some, some appropriate local regulations, either from the state or at the county level or, or, the, or at the you know, city level or the local municipality. And then you basically get a collections of hopefully not conflicting guidelines. And then I believe if small businesses use good faith to follow those guidelines, then um, they ought to have comfort that they can open up and you know, not get crushed by, uh, by lawsuits. Now, having said that, you also have to protect workers. And we could see situations, and we're seeing it right now in you know, the Midwest at some of the meatpacking facilities, et cetera, where you actually have outbreaks in the workplace. And I think there needs to be something there. And that's where things like our work and workers' compensation system, which is designed to provide relief to workers without kind of liability uh, to the employer, and people pay into it, create this fund, you could see that also intersecting this conversation in a smart way, where if there are, in fact, outbreaks in the workplace, uh, there ought to be some compensation for workers. So, I, you know, I think what that, you know, you need federal and, and local guidelines. If businesses use, you know, good faith, best efforts to follow those gu guidelines, they ought to feel like they can run their business, recognizing that as those guidance change, they're going to have to be nimble and adjust as well. And then the extent you are a worker and you're in a place and you've been ex your bit, your employer didn't do what it was supposed to do. In other words, it ignored all the regulations. That I think everyone agrees there should be responsibility there. You know, as a country, we have decided that the workplace should be safe for our workers, and we put regulations in place to do that. And if companies don't follow those, there's consequences of that, and it should be the same here. And we also have a system, like I said, around workers' compensation that deal with someone who's hurt in the workplace uh, without fault. And you could see that overlaying here for places where there's outbreaks. So I think that's how we have to think about it. I want to remind folks in about 10 minutes, we're going to open it up to the questions. They are starting to pour in. Um, Michael, what if you want to add to that? And also, um, yeah, if you thought I, about all the yeah, kind of ideas. I think to, to sort of piggyback off, off of John's uh, point, you know, one of what, look, there's going to be litigation that comes out of this at the end of the day. Uh, a business is going to get sued by a customer or, happening. Sure. or a consumer uh, around COVID-19. Um, so whether at the state level or the federal level, the question for both governments, uh, a governor, uh, you know, the Congress, the president, uh, it's going to be what level of, of liability are we going to allow? If, as John pointed out, my company, my business takes the safeguards that are recommended by CDC, the, the White House Commission on COVID-19, um, et cetera, and follows all of those uh, guidelines and remains nimble, as John pointed out, 
um, in adapting and adjusting as those guidelines change. And yet, and still at the end of the day, uh, someone comes in and levels a multi-million dollar lawsuit on me because their relative uh, passed away from COVID after contracting it, presumably at my establishment. How does that get worked out? Small business owners feel that in that narrative, they're not going to have a level of protections in place that mm -hmm. will safeguard them because they currently don't exist. So that's going to be a retooling of liability laws um, that are going to be a refining of policy around how the government steps in between uh, the consumer and, and uh, the, uh, the vendor or, or the restaurateur, whoever it happens to be. All of these are gonna be big questions. Right now, um, uh, there is a sort of a, a, a pause. People are hesitant. Um, consumers right now are hesitant to go back out into space. You're not seeing people flooding restaurants and the like. Restaurants, while they're opening, are, are taking those safety precautions. And a lot of that is driven by, for both sides, of the unknown. So it's the federal responsibility and the state responsibility to get at the table and understand exactly how they're going to address liability claims, what the liability law and policies are going to be. I don't see that happening in any earnest way right now. Let's not wait for the, the, the first series of mega lawsuits to come through and then in typical government re fashion react <laughs> to something that we know now is coming. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's where we find ourselves on this issue and spe specifically because businesses right now, Jason, are thinking about this stuff and they're trying to plan for it, um, but there's not a whole lot of guidance. Yeah. And we're going to hear on the next panel some of the conversations that have been happening, I think, uh, at the local business level. Um, say a little more, though, about the imperative to protect essential workers, right? I mean, I think it has been noted that there were, you know, 120 organizations, progressive organizations sent a letter to congressional leadership, basically pointing out the fact that we've already put some essential workers in harm's way. I think the, you know, food processing issues have been obviously high on the agenda, but mm -hmm. um, what do the two of you think about the right incentives um, to make sure that we're caring for the frontline workers? You know, there's been discussion about, you know, special bonuses for essential service workers. Um, you talked about OSHA protection. You know, what can we be doing to make sure that this is not a choice between worker safety and the revival of the economy? So it, it shouldn't be a choice. It's a false choice, as you said, uh, Jason. I think, I know I feel, and I think most people believe what essential workers have been doing in this country has been heroic. While a lot of us have been at home on Zoom calls, they're delivering packages, they're in the grocery stores, they're going to work every day, and it's really tough. So I, for one, am in favor of giving them additional compensation for what they've what they've been through. Now, there's lots of ways of doing that. I mean, the federal government's got a great program called the Earned Income Tax Credit, where you give tax credits to people who are earning below a certain level. A program like that could easily be adapted to provide the same kind of uh, refundable tax credit to people who are essential workers or certainly healthcare workers. There's other ways of having bonus programs. We clearly have to make sure that our workplace safety laws are updated to provide the protection. I mean, obviously every workplace should be giving their workers masks and gloves and other things that they need to keep themselves safe. So we gotta update our rules for doing that. And for certain industries, we probably have to make some funds available to help them do it. And some resources available to help them do it. Cause we all know a lot of these places were desperately trying to get this equipment and they couldn't get it. And so that gets an interesting liability question, right? Which is if you're doing your best, but you can't get the equipment. So I think all these things are really important. I think the, the overwhelming majority of the American people believe quite strongly that these workers uh, not only deserve our thanks, but they deserve our support. They deserve to work in conditions that are safe. Uh, so they're not putting themselves and then their families in harm way. And they get paid the kind of, uh, you know, it, it, my dad was an electrician, used to always say time and a half, time and a half, time and a half for, uh, you know, when you were working uh, overtime and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, this falls into that category. I mean, because what they're doing. So I, I think they definitely deserve that. But at the same time, we got to protect the businesses, you know, and, and that's the that's where I think there's there's uh, opportunity to do a deal because compensation and liability can be very separate issues. Mm -hmm. And we have to think of it that way. Just because these people deserve compensation, that doesn't mean it should all come out of uh, the backs of the businesses who are 
you know, not doing anything wrong in the overwhelming majority of cases, and in fact, trying to do everything right. So, um, Michael, dust off your 10th Amendment for me a little bit. We got 20 states or more who have already passed some kind of protections, often focused on healthcare workers and essential workers. I think the governor of uh, North Carolina passed right. a lot that a lot of Democrats are looking to. Um, but what do you think the role of the federal government should be here vis-a-vis -vis the states? I mean, with a, are we overstating uh, the importance of federal liability protection, or do you think that there's a role for Congress to provide that kind of overall ecosystem that then states build upon? I, I think given the nature of this pandemic and, and this, the wholesale impact it has had across the board on economies and health and all types of other things that we have yet to really begin to, to realize, like, for example, in the, in the insurance space, one of the big roles that I think the Congress can play in working with the states, uh, helping the states fashion their liability laws that around this issue, because each state has is going to be specific. There is not a one size is going to fit all. A rural community is going to have a very different kind of uh, liability regimen than New York City or Washington, D.C. will have. So you've got to respect that um, at the outset. But what role they can play is oversight, oversight, oversight. Um, mm -hmm. being, being the referee, if you will, making certain that those institutions, those insurance institutions, own up to their responsibility that state governments are actually looking at and planning for uh, and drilling down on, on these types of issues. Making certain that uh, businesses that are opening up, um, but more importantly, certainly those that have been using essential uh, employees, that there are safeguards in place that go beyond uh, what John was talking about in terms of the compensation, but also in terms of uh, liability uh, and, and safeguarding their well-being as well and making certain that they are protected. And that's a real concern right now, uh, particularly among a number of the major unions, SEIU, AFL, CIO. Um, and I would agree with that concern uh, to make sure that those essential workers um, are protected through OSHA and other agencies of government um, that, you know, while we focus on compensation, there are other attributes that we also need to be concerned about in terms of um, how those workers are being used, the hours that they're being exposed, the nature of the work that they're doing, all of those issues filter into the liability issue as well. Uh, and the oversight that's necessary, I think, to monitor that is going to be very, very important. So we're going to transition to, to questions here in a minute, but I just want to now take full advantage of our friendship and make the very unfair request that you now make some predictions that will, of course, be recorded in virtual reality for, forevermore. Um, so you think Congress can pull this off, right? I mean, because again, I want to end, this is, I'm trying to be intentionally um, manipulative in describing the world as we'd like to see it. When I've listened to the debates and the concerns that conservatives have had about more state and local aid, they've mostly been precedential. How do we create the right incentive structure? How do we only reward good behavior, not reward bad behavior? How do we make sure that we're not creating a new federal pension entitlement and make sure that what we're doing with state and local aid is really focused on the urgencies and exigencies of this crisis? Full stop. When you listen to the progressive concerns about liability protection, safe harbors, it's the same basic concern. It's not that there's nothing going on here, but how do we avoid this, you know, very particularized set of circumstances becoming now, I think, you know, a slippery slope for fundamentally reorienting the very um, carefully kind of architected liability provisions in the country. Um, it feels to me like there's, you know, good leadership could figure out how to put something together here that addressed that with some, I think, rather hopeful symmetry. Um, but it's complicated as all heck, right? I mean, these are not easy conversations to, for us to have. And certainly when you get into the precise details of duty to care and negligence and gross thing, I mean, the details become extremely important. Congress probably got about a month to bang this out. They've had a couple of hearings. I mean, what, what's your sense? What are you feeling from conversations with your colleagues, the White House? They're going to pull this off, or have we seen the last of the major bipartisan CARES Act? Oh, I think the, I think something else will be done. I mean, the process for getting there will be messy and ugly. 
But if, if you talk about not this issue for a second and talk about the issue about providing support to state and local governments, my sense is not only is that something that the whole Democratic caucus and the Congress is unified around, but I think a lot of Republicans want that as well. Because this is, you know, this is often positioned as pensions for public employees, but it's also about keeping police and fire and first responders you know, engaged and working and not having really deep budget cuts because unlike the federal government, all these states have to balance their budgets. Right. It's gonna be very painful. So I think there's a strong draw for something around supporting states and local governments that will obviously be not necessarily what, what some people are asking for in terms of the amount of support, but there's gonna be something to do there. And that becomes kind of the main driver of the next bill in my judgment and then other stuff gets hung on top of that or like ornaments on a tree. Then I think this is one of those things because if you're cutting a deal, there's enough Republicans who are gonna care strongly about something being done here and that'll get into the mix. And then to me, the real action is gonna be what do we do around workers? Is there gonna be another stimulus check? And if so, that will likely be paired with something to encourage people to get, you know, to go into the workforce because I think people want to make sure we're, we're, we're not creating too many incentives for people not to re-engage in the workforce. So I see those as kind of the four corners of a bill. And I think we'll get there. It's, not gonna, it's, it's unlikely to be a $3 trillion bill, um, but I think it'll be a meaningful piece of legislation. Yeah, Michael, quick, yeah. hold this. Just, uh, you know, just give us yeah. a confident view of the future. Yeah, no, I, I I agree in large part with what John put out there. I think that's right that there there's going to be another uh, round, another effort on this, uh, probably less than three trillion. But here's I, I think it's something that you know, I think is important to your question about how this sort of takes shapes. I think conversations like this with leadership from bipartisan policy center and others out there, members of the Hill who have already been working together around some of these issues, be bold about it. Just go into the space. The country needs that kind of leadership right now. Um, we need to walk away from the typical traditional partisan BS that, that sort of drives these narratives underneath the surface and recognize that 36 million people uh, don't have jobs right now. Um, 14 plus percent unemployment, 18 percent unemployment, uh, in Hispanic community, 16% unemployment in the Black community, women uh, who are another big part of the backbone of our economy, unemployed in large numbers. So what are you going to do about that? You can sit around all day long and, and, and do the partisan fight, but as we get closer to November, the consequences of elections are going to begin to change the narrative a little bit. So fellas and ladies, get ahead of that. You know it's coming, so get ahead of it. Start the work now, tap into those bipartisan um, veins inside that exist inside the House and the Senate. Let those individuals lead in this if you're too afraid to get out there for your partisan reasons. Let others kind of push the, the narrative along. And I think um, we'll see something that's gonna be a better longer term than sort of the stops and starts that we see right now. I wanna to turn to the, the question function. I am now at the uh, high risk portion of the event. I need to do this without actually shutting off the Zoom. Um, and I'm gonna to try to integrate a couple, we have a variety of different questions coming in, but a couple of themes um, reveal themselves. One is the question about whether the federal government should take a, a financial role, some kind of claims fund or a reinsurance fund. I think the recognition that, you know, at some point there's existential risk here beyond which that anybody could have possibly planned for. I think it's been noted that um, pandemics uh, are explicitly um, not covered in many, many corporations' insurance policies. And so, you know, post 9-11, we had the terrorism risk insurance program. And do you see any kind of role here for a federal pot of money to basically kind of cap that unpredictable aspect of liability? I do. As I said, I think this notion of separating compensation from liability is a smart way to move forward because you can deal with compensation in a social insurance way. And that's what we do with workers' compensation. So uh, we see already that the Treasury Department was allocated $500 billion for specific relief. To This was beyond the PPP program, which really wasn't about helping businesses. It was about getting people employed. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and they've spent maybe a hundred billion of that on airlines and a few others. So you see that, you know, even within the money we've allocated, there's some pretty big pots of money where you could have some creative things. So I definitely think at a time like this where, to Michael's point, which is it's time to stop pointing fingers and second guessing. It's time to move forward. It's time to recognize that sometimes you have injury without fault. It's time to recognize we're all in this together. And uh, we, we, you know, we have to, we, you know, we have to confront this, you know, prior generations have confronted much more graver threats, but they do it as a unified way. And that's what we've got to do here. And the, the way to do that is to recognize there's harm and there's pain and to compensate people for that, but to separate it from the finger pointing. Because again, in January of this year, no one thought this was an issue. The White House didn't, the Congress didn't, business did in the stock market. And anyone who says they did, they're just lying because no one actually thought this was a big issue. And look what it's done. So clearly this notion of kind of looking back and pointing fingers is just not productive because no one's got clean hands on this thing. So let's try to figure out how to take care of people who have been, who have been you know, injured and support them. That's the, one of the roles of government to have that kind of safety net. And let's try to separate it as much as we can from liability, particularly if people have acted in good faith and create a fund, whether it's workers comp or something like that to provide some compensation. I agree with that. Michael, you want to comment on that or should I turn to another question? No, I'll just go on to the, I, what he said. So I think the um, other question, and I, this is coming from a couple of different ways and there's some pretty specific questions I'm leaving to the, uh, the next panel. But a couple of folks have asked in some ways the rhetorical question, if it's safe to reopen the economy, why are we having this conversation? Why do we need any kind of liability shield? I think a premise that there's kind of more of a on off switch around safety. And I think that really does raise kind of where we started this conversation, which is how do we balance these incentives which are necessarily in tension? How do we understand the public health threats of the pandemic and the public health threats of economic deprivation and come up with a system that makes the best out of that very difficult situation? So I think I'm gonna, put this back to you almost where we started the conversation, ask you to make kind of some closing thoughts on just this question of how do you feel like we're doing? And, you know, what do you feel like the next few months should look like as we move towards reopening the economy? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. I, you know, I, I have a much more conservative approach to all of this because of the unknowns. The unknowns are, are, are I think, a lot deeper and a lot more serious than than people really want to acknowledge. I, I get the, the lurch towards wanting to open the economy. Um, we've all taken an economic hit uh, in this and uh, having to you know rebalance household budgets and figure out where you're going to pay for the next thing and, and all of that. Um, but uh, I then look and say, I've got my family uh, who are safe. My parents are safe. Um, they are protected. And so I put a greater value and premium on that um, than I do on the economic piece. Why? Because when it's all said and done, I can recover from the economy. Um, and But recovering from death is a lot harder to do. I don't really know only one person who's been able to do that in history. And we've been told to wait till it happens in the future. So I don't know when that's going to be. So I'm going to take care of me and mine now. So that for me is where I think a lot of Americans are. That's what the polling is showing us. There is a genuine concern about opening too soon and relapsing. And I don't think we're having a serious enough conversation about what does a relapse do in October, November, December, uh, or the first quarter of next year. Um, because we have not taken the necessary policy precautions as well as uh, literal precautions uh, with the health piece um, because we pushed out on the economic. So I'm looking for our leadership to balance that a lot more than, than they have so far. Uh, and for governors and presidents and members of Congress to be understanding of where the American people are in this. We're not rushing to get out there to get that tattoo or that massage, because at the end of the day, after we get it, we'd like to stay healthy. So it's better to prepare on the front end as opposed to worry about that on the back end. Note to self, Michael's still getting a tattoo sometime in October. Uh, <laughs> John, last last word on the first panel, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Michelle. So I think Michael just framed it really well. I mean, we have to remember this is a decision about managing risk and about trade-offs. 
we've become really bad as a nation at trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously we have to have good public health and we have to have a good economy. And we can't have either of those things unless we have both of those things. And there are, there are downsides to opening up in a reckless way, clearly, and we could think about that in terms of the loss of human life. But there are downsides around staying closed for, you know, uh, for too long. Anxiety, depression, you know, student learning issues, economic ruin, you know, debts we're passing on to the next generation that they won't be able to pay. So it really does take compassionate and courageous leaders at this moment in time to guide us through those trade-offs. And it shouldn't be a partisan issue. You know, Michael and I live in Maryland, and I'm sure he agrees that our governor, a Republican, has been appropriately cautious in how to reopen the state. But in Colorado, a Democratic governor, Jared Polis, I think he's been really smart about leaning into opening Colorado probably a little faster because of what's happened on the ground in Colorado. So we need just the right kind of leaders who look at these two things and come up with the appropriate balance based on the facts. I mean, clearly with the benefit of hindsight, we would have been much better off maybe waiting a little bit to lock down the whole country and, and lock down nursing homes as a number one priority day one. You know, we should have made sure people going into nursing homes were tested and not a bunch of celebrities and athletes getting tested and announcing their results on social media what about the workers going into these nursing homes? You know, so we have to look at what we've learned, not point fingers, you know, because that's not productive, not second guess, that's not productive, but actually be really smart about how we go forward to try to optimize the public health option uh, outcome and do what we can to offset some of the negatives of, of, of being too closed. And you know, compassionate, courageous leaders who speak to the unity that this country needs is what we need right now. That's what I think. Well, thank you both. Um, we asked you to do this because uh, we expected and hoped that you would raise the bar a little bit for the rest of the country. Um, think about what it means to be a pragmatic partisan and figure out what we can do to call upon Congress to keep uh, the momentum going. I mean, I think it has um, been long said that Congress governs in crisis, and that's a whole lot better than not governing in crisis. And so, you know, I think we feel like there has been some real achievements that this Congress has laid down. And I think, um, I hope that uh, we will take from this conversation that they have more work to do and that this is a serious and complicated discussion. They're gonna have to roll up their sleeves and uh, engage together. I thank you very much for joining us this morning and uh, setting the stage. I will turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Michelle Nellenbach, who is the director of strategic initiatives at the BPC, and she will introduce three panelists. We'll have another 25, 30 minute uh, discussion and then some more questions. So Michael, John, thank you. Michelle, I turn it over to you. Great, thanks Jason. And uh, again, thank you to um, the Congressman and Lieutenant Governor. That was an incredibly informative panel. I'm gonna invite the next panel to uh, turn on their video and unmute themselves so we can, we can start our discussion. Um, we are going to be joined by the Honorable Vincent George, who is a former member of the DC Council and current president and CEO of the DC Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Bo Cutter is a senior fellow and director of the National American Economy Project at the Roosevelt Institute. He's the co-chair of the Ad Hoc Subcommittee for COVID-19 for the Committee for Economic Development of the Conference Board. And Karen Harned is the executive director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, Small Business Legal Center. So we're gonna dive a little bit more in, into detail in terms of what's happening on the ground in um, cities and towns across the country as they are grappling with this decision of whether to reopen or not and what the potential ramifications are of that decision. And as Jason alluded to, a lot of our questions are coming through about you know, balancing the safety public health issues with the economic risks that were you know, posed by the shutdowns. And so I'm gonna dive into some of that and hear a little bit more about well, how businesses are really viewing these issues. So I wanna start with you, um, Vincent, you represent and work with a, a variety of different businesses in the District of Columbia. Uh, can you give us a picture of what you're seeing and hearing in terms of continuing challenges these businesses are facing as they, they consider reopening? The DC government has not reopened yet. They're looking at probably mid-June, I think at this point. 
So how are your businesses looking at this? What are they asking the city for? And are, how much of the liability issues coming up in those discussions? Uh, well, first of all, Jolene, thank you very much uh, for having me uh, here this morning. Uh, you mentioned, you called me Vincent George. It's Vincent Orange. Oh, Orange. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yes, you're right. Yeah, that, that's okay. <laughs> and I'm the president of the DC Chamber of Commerce. Uh, here in, in the District of Columbia, uh, our businesses are suffering just like all the businesses uh, through, throughout the United States. You're right that uh, we are still closed. The mayor has an order that indicates that we will remain closed until June 8th. However, over the past week, we have been receiving really good uh, numbers on the, uh, the tracking. And at least we have seven consecutive days where our numbers have been reduced. Tomorrow, she will have a press conference and it's expected that we may uh, begin to open up certain aspects of the government in the city. So we're looking very forward to that. Uh, the big concern for uh, you know, the business uh, community here in the nation's capital is one of confidence uh, of you know, our residents ready to come back out. Will they feel safe? Uh, what type of testing will be available? Uh, antibody testing. Uh, and, and just getting the economy open and, and, and running. And there is the question of, of, of liability. Uh, people wanna know that when you enter a particular entity that that entity is, uh, has a safe environment that is following the CDC guidelines, is following the guidelines of the District of Columbia Department of Health and that uh, you just have an environment where everybody's working together. They're wearing their masks, they're, doing, they're exercising social distancing. So, the same things that are basically taking place in other areas. We're very unique in this area in that Virginia has uh, opened and Maryland has opened. However, in uh, the Washington metropolitan area, Prince George's County has not opened. Montgomery County has not opened in the District of Columbia. So, uh, and we're all closely in close proximity. So I do believe that those leaders are speaking to each other and. Uh, the, the trend of new cases and uh, are going down. So we expect some big news tomorrow. Oh, that, that's great. Um, I will also add where I live in Virginia, Fairfax County is also still not open. And we, we're hearing next Friday because those areas are much more densely populated than the rest of the states and, and of course the district. Um, so Karen, I wanna jump to you a little bit here because you also represent a num obviously the nation's independent businesses a lot of the discussion about around business liability in recent weeks, the topic is usually spoken in general terms, treating all types of businesses the same. Um, you also obviously represent small and independent companies. Can you help provide some texture to the discussion based on what you're hearing from your members about reopening and liability and how they, how they think those issues need to be addressed? Right, so NFIB uh, represents, we're the largest business association um, for independent businesses with 300,000 members across the country, all 50 states. And when we look at this issue, you know, everybody always asks me, well, what is a small business? Well, for the majority of our members, a small business is a business that has 10 employees or fewer. So that's the prism in which we typically look at all of these issues, including the one we're discussing today, liability. And when we did, we have the active research with our members and as uh, Michael still alluded to in the first panel, our most recent research shows that 70% of our members are concerned about liability when it comes to reopening. Um, for them, uh, they are concerned about many of the things that Vincent just said. I mean, they're concerned about making sure they can keep their employees safe, making sure they can keep their customers safe and making sure they can keep third parties like vendors safe when they come to their business um, and what that means for them. So we're hearing about, you know, how do I get PPE? Um, what PPE do I need? These sorts of things um, already. Uh, but to the same extent, they're also concerned they could get sued by the employee, the customer, and the third party. And that is very much something that they're focused on and how they can protect themselves from that. Because honestly, um, those that are surviving the pandemic, the last, I mean, a lawsuit would put them out of business easily. I mean, they just can't, they can't sustain that. So that's, um, that is really the initial conversations that we're having with our members on this issue. Great. Um, so Bo, let's, let's bring you into the conversation now. So the next, okay. um, the, the new, the next America Economy Initiative at the Roosevelt Institute, you spent a lot of time studying 
business dynamism and the challenges and opportunities facing small businesses. So what are you seeing today in terms of dynamism and the effects of this crisis? And how do the issues around liability play into that? Well, let me let me back up just one minute sure. to just say something about what you just said. Um, if you some of this is an, is by this point a real truism, but if you if if you look at the way our economy works, small and medium enterprise is a fun, is fundamentally critical to the business, and not just in weight, but in dynamism. In in weight. You know, there's some 38, 39 million business, small, small and medium enterprises. They, they employ somewhere in the range of half of all of the people in the country. Uh, all the, but much more important than that, it's more and more obvious, or it has been, that first, that over the long run, most jobs and, and most growth was created by a relatively small number in any given year of small, new, or medium, new enterprises. And what's been clear also in the last oh, couple of decades is that the formation of those kinds of enterprises has begun, begun to decline anyway. This is before COVID. So one of the reasons, and it's a, it's a complicated topic and people will disagree all over a lot about it, but one of the reasons for our declining rate of growth in the last 20 years or so, 30, is the, is the fact that we've seen a declining rate of business formation. And, there, and that means a sort of declining entry into the workforce of all of those new workers that vibrant new dynamic businesses create. Well, COVID and the pandemic makes all that worse, makes all that worse. The, we've heard exactly the same things that both other panels have, have already talked about on, the, on the, uh, the, the CED conference board task force that I co-chair. Uh, over and over and over again, our trustees, the bulk, the bulk of whom are the CEOs of small and medium enterprises, not the giants, talk about their deep concern about how do you move forward at all. And they talk quite explicitly in the terms that, that you've just heard. Uh, and I came away from hearing all of those discussions and listening to the really excellent first panel that you put on. I thought Congressman Delaney and Lieutenant Governor Steele were great. And I thought that a couple of things, if I could, if, if you'd, I, I can stop where I did, or if you'd like me to go. No, nope, go ahead. The, the first thing that they said that I think really matters is this distinction between uh, liability and compensation. Uh, I hadn't heard it said quite as well as they did. And I think that's an important thing to bear in mind that we can come back to. The, the, the second point that, that neither of them made explicitly, but they certainly both made implicitly, was we're gonna look at a dance for the next year between a step forward, half a step backward, a step forward, half a step backward. We're gonna see, do something and it won't work. And we're gonna do something else and it might work. And that's gonna be occurring differently in 50 states. So, and it, said, it speaks to two things. The first is that these, the, that the, the, the sort of roles of levels of government begin to break out, which is to say it's, it is the role of the national government, I think, to put in place a, a sort of very broad patterning, you might say, of what's right. But there's no conceivable way that a federal government can, can set all of the explicit standards. It's, that's going to have to be pretty local and often industry by industry. The third thing that hit me and where I disagreed with the first panel was if you think of that and you think that that back and forth dance that I said we're in and you think about what's happening to the economy, that inevitably means that while I think there will be a recovery, it's gonna be slow and it's gonna cost more than we bet. And I wouldn't at all Bet against whether uh, bet against the, the the possibility of there being a, a couple of substantially of substantial size 
programs of expenditure coming out of the Congress. I think they're going to have to be. That's my my third point. Uh, I'll stop there. Well, great. Vincent, do you want to jump in there? Yes. So, so Michelle, I, I think that one thing we really have to look for is the common ground. I believe that any talk of a nationwide immunity for businesses is dead on arrival, that someone that is operating in, in an unreasonably unsafe manner during the pandemic uh, should be held, held liable. But at the same time, and I, I think Karen probably can speak more to this, because I know they're discussing liability protection principles, where it seems to be a more of a reasonable approach, where you, uh, you know, examine is someone grossly negligent? Is there intentional misconduct? Is someone operating intoxicated? Those seem to, to me to be, uh, you know, just common ground that we can build up on. And then, you know, you get to the point where, you know, a lot of times there are frivolous lawsuits. We need to define what's frivolous. Uh, but at the end of the day, it seems to me to be, you know, three, three issues or three parties here. One, there are uh, the employer, then the workers. And when you look at workers, you also have to say workers and their families because they mm -hmm. come home and they go back home. And then you have the customer th themselves. And for, you know, I think for a small business, I mean, one question that I would want to know is that the person that came into my entity was that person already affected with COVID-19? How do I ascertain that? And then now in my environment, if I'm following all the proper procedures, should I be held liable when I'm doing everything that you know, I was required to do? And then as a customer, once again, uh, the customer coming through the door, is the, is the customer a carrier? Or did something occur in my environment to make that customer a, 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 uh, to become a carrier through some negligence, some gross negligence, some intentional misconduct. So it seems to me there, there is enough for both parties for there to be a bipartisan solution if we deal with the common ground that make uh, more sense. But someone operating in an unsafe environment that is doing unsafe things, uh, it should be a, a no starter in, in my view. And Vincent, I think you pretty much just summarized why BPC wanted to have this event today, because there there is common ground, and I think some of it's common sense, and, and you outlined that really, really well. I think some of the challenges is how do you define it? I um, I was a lawyer wannabe. The LSAT didn't quite go my way, so I can't get into too much detail on this, but I think there's a distinction between what is gross negligence and negligence, and where do you draw that line? And so maybe that's a good spot for Karen if you want to jump in and talk a little bit about how, how N5B is looking at those issues. Right. So I I definitely appreciated what Vincent was saying there on many um, counts. First of all, you know, uh, by just discussing what you're dealing with with you know, a customer coming in the door, you're not going to necessarily know whether or not they have COVID and these sorts of things. So we definitely think that shows even more why some sort of liability protection is critical for small business owners. Because if you're doing the best you can do, that's all you can do, right? You cannot control um, all these externalities that are, you know, uh, coming into your business every time. And so for us, we think, um, uh, there, we did put together some principles and our principles were developed thinking honestly a little bit differently than a lot of the bigger businesses will think of these issues. For 93% of um, small business owners, they never go to court. And that's important because um, there is a part of the trial bar that um, knows this and quite frankly takes advantage of it. And that's uh, the frivolous lawsuits that we will often see. And what we have seen with other statutes where there's been a cause of action, somebody can, you know, say somebody didn't, you know, follow this statute this way or that way, that is just a breeding ground for um, these types of extortionate lawsuits where a trial attorney, and we really call them the bottom feeders of the trial bar, because I think there are a lot of trial attorneys that are not going to engage in this kind of work. In fact, the majority probably do not. But those that do will literally extort our members and say, we're going to take you to court unless you give us X amount of money. And they actually don't even care if you remedy anything. And we've seen this in the Americans with Disabilities Act context. We've seen this with the telephone community. Uh, Cations Protection Act, the do not call, the do not fax. 
And um, we really, and then in the asbestos realm, there's still those lawsuits that are out there where small business owners are, I literally have one member that their name was put on a napkin that they had worked for this one construction company and it was up to them to prove why they should not be sued for asbestos exposure. So that is what is the background for our principles, which are when it comes to employees, as the first panel mentioned, we have a workers' comp system. It is designed particularly for this. Now, many states do not cover illnesses where you're home with the flu. We think that's completely appropriate. It, you know, we could have a conversation if somebody ends up getting, you know, deathly ill or there's a death that follows it. But again, the workers' comp system is designed for that and, you know, figuring out did it really happen at work. That, that system already exists and we think that that is just fine when it comes to the employees and that they will be protected because they are currently under workers' comp laws across the country in which all of our members pay in every year they're required to. And then in addition, we think for exposure, as um, Vincent said, good faith compliance and even the first panel there are, the guidelines are going to be very different and should be different for, this is not a one size fits all. It's going to be very different for the small auto repair shop with five employees versus the restaurant that can seat a hundred. Their protocols are going to be completely different. They cannot be hand, you know, put to the same standards, but they should have standards that they comply with and show that they are trying to keep their people safe, which again, in all of our conversations with our members, they're, they're going to do that. They want to do that. They know that the government's not bringing back this economy. It's going to be the consumers and the people coming and feeling safe coming into their business. And then also we think that, you know, only true physical injury should be compensated. As we know, there are many of us, thankfully, that are may contract this awful virus, but never really have any major symptoms beyond at most the flu. And, um, you know, and so as a result, we need to make sure that only a true physical injury that's serious is compensated when we're looking at liability. And finally, um, for the small businesses I represent, again, we are worried the most about the bottom feeder trial bar that is going to try to use this as an opportunity to make a quick buck for them. And so any guardrails we can put at the beginning through pleading standards being tied in and that sort of thing that make it harder for people to get into court um, you know, or only, you know, for frivolous reasons, that is really something that we are looking at because we think that's going to be the way to, to prevent these shakedown lawsuits that unfortunately we hear a lot about from our members. Okay. Thank, thanks, Karen. That, that was really helpful. Um, I've heard everyone has kind of talked about standards and best practices and guidance from federal agencies. One of the themes that came up repeatedly in the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing last week was that there is insufficient guidance right now, at least coming from the federal government. Some states and local governments have perhaps um, have more thorough guidance out there. But um, Bo, you co-authored a piece for Fortune Magazine that called for clearer guidance on workforce, workforce policies. Uh, CDC did release some updated guidance last week. Do you have any thoughts on whether that is, provides enough information for employees as, as employers as they're moving forward? You never say enough's enough because then you'll be immediately see a place where it isn't. I've read them. Obviously, we wrote about them. Uh, I, I think that I think CDC did quite a good job. But once again, the, the point that I think that all three of us and I think both both of the first two panelists mentioned is that those are those are going to get are necessarily get interpreted more specifically as you go to different levels of government and, and several different kinds of industries. The, the distinction between the five person auto garage and the restaurant that seats a hundred is very much on point. So while I, and that's kind of what I meant by a patterning that I think the CDC has done, has done a pretty good job. Could it do better? I guess it could. I, I'm certainly not an expert on the pandemic or on sort of then how do you counter it? but. We think it did do a pretty good job, but but now it does have to be. That's of no great comfort to a company that employs twenty people uh, and has to has to make these decisions if there's not some way of that becoming more specific. Um, and, and if I could mention just one or two other things that I think bear on this, I've been in the course of 
the the work that we've done, but also the the, the work. Uh, that I've done through the Next American Economy stuff, quite taken by a lot of the work done by uh, Diana Farrell of the Chase Manhattan uh, Institute, and where they've they've looked at mega data uh, in terms of transactions through the bank, and tried to look at what's happening with small business. And one of the things that jumps out is that the vast vast majority of small businesses have less than a month's cash. Uh, at any time, at any time. And so there's no wonder they don't go to court. They could eat up the month and then all of the room they have, but it's also amplifies the fears and concerns they have. So in, if in the best of concern, best of circumstances, that's sort of all the discretionary room they've got. Yeah. Uh, under these circumstances, that's even less. And under these circumstances, if you want them coming back, you're going to have to. Uh, be somewhat more specific, a lot more specific, and you're going to have to, I think, draw the distinction that the first panel did quite a good job of drawing between uh, compensation and liability. If I could make two other brief points. The, the, the one is, at the same point, exactly the same point about fear and sort of not a whole lot of running room in terms of cash applies to the individual worker also. And they are just as afraid, not of being sued in their particular case, but the, the, just of getting ill. And then what happens? So the, I think the pervasiveness of fear about all of this, not a lot of which is crazy, is, is a big deal. And it's why I think we're gonna see this back and forth dance for a year or so and why I think the economy is gonna recover more slowly than we might think. And I think we have to put in place all of the kinds of things that we possibly can to allow that very iterative marginal step by marginal step process to keep going forward. So let me give you a disagreement with one of our panelists. I, I, I do disagree that the current workmen's compensation laws are sufficient. They can't be. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there are going to be there. People are both afraid, but but there's a legitimate basis for the fear. Some some reasonable proportion of them are going to get quite sick, and I that's why I think that I that's why I was quite taken by this distinction between compensation and liability. Uh, that. You are gonna live in a world, and we hear exactly the same things that both of the two panelists have also mentioned. One is that, how do I know the customer who walks in the door, no matter what precautions I've taken, doesn't, isn't already uh, kind of actively infectious. Same thing is true, how do I know that of my employees and my own vendors? So there is, a, there is enormous amount of both fear, but, but sort of, legitimate concern that no matter how responsible I am in my business, the wall, the, the borders of that are pretty permeable and, and, and the borders of that can get broken and I can get sued for that. So I, I think, I think the, that the, 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 the fact that this is going to be so iterative in how it gets better, makes leadership with respect to it both very, both crucial. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Steele's last point, or maybe it was Congressman Delaney's last point, was absolutely right. It also makes it harder because there's not gonna be any clear cut moment. There's, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna, it requires not just sort of energetic uh, leadership, but also committed leadership that stays on the job, uh, that, that keeps focusing on it. If, if I can just pick, pick you sure, back, please do. Uh, pick back on what what uh, Bo is, is is saying here. Uh, clearly, we're fighting the war against COVID nineteen right now, but we don't want to fight that war in the courthouse with all these lawsuits. And something that Lieutenant Governor uh, Michael Steele indicated: we need to address it now before the politics just takes over completely. Uh, I'm satisfied with what the CDC is doing, but depending on who you're talking to. Uh, they feel that they, they can't say what they really want to say because of politics. 
Now, uh, I'm the president of, of the DC Chamber of Commerce, but I'm also a member of the United States Chamber of Commerce in the committee of 100 uh, CEOs. And I know the US Chamber is really saying, let's just hold the truly bad actors accountable, but protect employers following the public health uh, guidelines. And they have like five points that they put out where these protections should remain for th this group. One is businesses that work to follow government guidelines against COVID-19 should be protected. Healthcare providers and facilities on the front lines should be protected. Manufacturers that repurpose production and distribution to provide PPEs, sanitizers, and other needed countermeasures should be protected. Companies that have donated their, their stock of supplies to hospitals and medical professionals, and, and even some public companies that are facing lawsuits simply because you know, their shareholders are saying, you didn't warn us, uh, you didn't warn us about COVID-19. So you know, that's a place where maybe we can look at for some common ground as we look at the limited protection principles that's, uh, that Karen is talking about, as well as you know, just working on both sides of the aisle to come to that common ground and no one really gets stuck in one position. At the end of the day, we're all in this together. Together we stand, divided we fall, let's get it done before the politics just completely takes over and then we all lose. And I would just like to say one thing in response to that. I, I agree with, with what Vincent was just saying there, but I do think as we're talking about guidelines and the CDC guidelines and whatever our state or locality may put, put out, that as, as Vincent just said in the principles that the chamber was talking about, you know, good faith compliance should be, you know, working towards that should be the, the, the quote unquote standard, if you will. The reason, and I'm, I'm a little concerned about too much specificity and here's why. Because in our experience with small business owners under the Americans with Disabilities Act, somebody will come into their business literally to try to find a lawsuit and will measure in the bathroom um, where the guardrail is. And if it's a quarter of an inch off of what the statute says, they're stuck with the lawsuit. They're stuck with a threatened lawsuit. And that is, we do not want restaurants, you know, having to face these lawsuits where somebody comes in and says, oh, but that table was five feet and eight inches away from the other table. So now we can sue. I mean, that is exactly the type of, of lawsuit that we are very, very worried about. And so, we need to really think about this because everybody's talking about standards, but good faith compliance is, you know, you're, you're going to find the wrongful people that are not trying to do anything to protect anybody. And those, they get what they get. That's not who we're talking about here. And specificity can also lead to the kind of problems that we're trying to guard against. Great. Well, thank you all. I think um, we're coming up on uh, time to open this up for to the Q and a. Uh, so, those of you on Zoom, you can go into the Q&A and add questions. I'm going to read them from my phone because I can't access the Q&A on an iPad. So I don't think I'm rude when I'm looking down because um, someone's texting me them. So we have one. Um, for, so if state and local federal governments can't ensure some late level of safety, and Jason asked the same question earlier, should we be telling small businesses to reopen at all? And I think we touched on some of the economic ramifications of not reopening, but I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Well, I would say telling a small business not to open up at all is sort of like you know, a suicide because at the end of the day, small businesses need to operate in order to provide, uh, you know, uh, to, to provide for their own quality of life. Uh, uh, you know, without that small business, then they have no revenue coming in. They're not providing a, a service that is needed. And if they have employees, that's going to affect, you know, uh, their employees and the owner and the employees' families are going to be, uh, uh, you know, impacted as well. So I do think that we do want to get small businesses open again. It's just we are talking about what kind of safeguards can we provide for a small business that is in compliance with all the CDC requirements, the requirements of the states and doing everything that is reasonably possible to provide a safe environment. Okay. Um, so one from Nicole, um, without 100% accurate contact tracing, there's no way to determine where the individual contracted the virus. And I know uh, Vincent and Karen both touched on this. Um, 
So how can a business be held liable if we can't in fact prove they got it from within a business? And then um, how will this impact commercial liability insurance? Anyone want to take that one on? Well, I'd just like to start by saying, how can they prove liable? They can't. I mean, that's the issue. And from our perspective, again, knowing that our members are not going to be able to um, go to court to be able to afford to do that, that's why I feel like you're, you're going to need to have uh, some protection for small business owners that are trying to do the right thing and working hard um, you know, to keep their businesses safe because they can only control what they can control. Yeah, and I would just say as a matter of law, one would have to establish nexus. I mean, what is the contact, you know, what is the cause of your injury and where did that cause take place? And that, that could be a very high standard. I mean, it is the, the standard of law, but uh, one would have to, you know, uh, establish a nexus between their injury and where that injury occurred. Except that as the question points out, uh, that's exactly the problem Correct. is that with the, 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 from whether it's a customer, a worker or a vendor perspective, the poor person who runs the small business can't really know. So, the, so there is, there, there is a very real problem of, of how do you, um, target liability, which again is why I think there's, it's quite reasonable to begin to think about making a distinction between, between liability with respect to kind of gross malpractice and compensation with respect to the way this world is, in, is going to wind up working for the next year, next year and a half. Oh, and on the a final point is that in talking to our trustees and, uh, and in preparation or to think a little bit about this panel, I did, I talked to some of my former colleagues in other lives. Uh, if we let it develop, there will be an insurance, uh, insurance that are, uh, rises up around this. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a quite good thing. Well, that kind of goes to one of the questions that somebody has just raised on, um, on the Q&A is that should there be, and you talked about this a little bit, Bo, and I think Congressman Delaney did, uh, a federal fund to pay claims against small businesses that don't involve gross negligence, and should Congress create some sort of mediation processes, process that minimizes the legal costs? Without knowing exactly what that means, my answer is it sounds about <laughs> right, uh, is that I, I, when Congressman Delaney made the distinction Mm -hmm. between, uh, and I think he was the first one that did, and then, uh, then Lieutenant Governor Steele enlarged on it, between compensation and liability, I thought, yeah, that's right. I mean, that it's a, that, that there, we, we really ought in these very particular circumstances start to draw that line. Yeah. And the, the only place that money is gonna come from is, for, mm -hmm. is gonna be from the federal government. The states don't have any money, the cities don't have any money, the private sector can't can't pay for that kind of thing. So I, so I do think in fact, that, that they'll probably need, need to be additional funding. Uh, and to go back, I also think that, that we should give room for, the insur for, for, for insurance to develop around that kind of thing, because I think insurance companies themselves will put in place standards. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with, with Bo, uh, clearly uh, having the fund would relieve the pressure on the small businesses to, to actually you know, operate. And, and it would also give them an incentive to do the right thing. So if something does occur, then the, 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 the grieved person or victim would access this fund, which clearly would have a whole set of criteria <laughs> that, that one would have to go through, but it would take the pressure off of that business and earning you know, significant uh, legal fees. So I, I, I agree with you. Uh, Clearly, the devil's in the details, but right. in theory, uh, that would be a good direction. And the federal government would be, uh, you know, protecting uh, uh, small businesses. And at the end of the day, it's our taxpayers' dollars uh, that would be utilized, I think, in a positive fashion. If I could add to those to that comment, which I agree with completely, we are inevitably in the circumstance in which we try to use 
the examples of the past to create a path here. But except for the possible circumstance of the, of the Spanish flu virus in, in 1918, we've never had these circumstances before. And we are gonna have to invent sort of new forms to be able to get through this. So the <laughs> fact that we haven't done X before and the fact that we held people responsible for things in a different way before doesn't cut much ice with me because the I think we have an enormous, enormous uh, hill to climb over mm -hmm. the course of the next year, year and a half if we, if we want to get out of this and if we want the economy to work, be working sanely again. And I think we're going to have to do a lot of institutional invention pretty fast in order to be able to get there. So I, we're coming up on the close, but I do want to ask one final question that came in over the Q&A um, because I think it raises one of the central tensions we're seeing about the conversation around liability tends to focus on the needs of the business. Um, and I think there's a perception then that it's not, you're not focused on the customer or the potential, the employee who could potentially become sick. So Vicki Shabo, I hope I said that right, um, said she's concerned there's a lot of focus uh, from NFIB in the chamber on protecting businesses from sick customers, but what about protecting customers from sick workers? Um, despite FFCRA, federal law does not require most businesses to provide paid sick time. What rules and safeguards should customers expect related to paid sick leave? And what rules should ensure employees have access to paid sick time without retribution at work? Well, one thing I, I would say is that the employer should be held responsible for its employees and should be, uh, you know, try to ensure that its employees are not spreading COVID-19. Uh, so you know, there should be some form of, of testing and, and once again, providing a safe environment for one to enter into. Now that may become uh, clearly problematic if it's a huge, you know, operation. Uh, but, uh, you know, just as, as a focal point, there has to be some concern of, about the, uh, your customers uh, uh, and the customers and their families, as well as the workers too. But you would want to have workers that are, you know, uh, COVID-19 free from the beginning. Yeah, and I would just say, I mean, honestly, NFIB opposed um, the paid leave requirements and there's a reason for it. Our members, you know, the 70, what, 4% of small business owners provide this type of leave um, for their employees, but those that don't, don't because they can't afford it, not because they don't want to. All that said, every conversation we've had with small business owners throughout this entire pandemic has been not just about the health of their business, but the health of their employees. And so I just think that, you know, it's, you cannot, for most, for the vast majority of small business owners, they care very much about those employees and keeping them safe and are not encouraging them to come to work. And I don't know that we need an extra government mandate to ensure that happens because quite frankly, if they're not doing that now, a government mandate isn't gonna make that change anyway. Great, well, we are up on our hour and a half. So I wanna thank, I don't know if anyone has any closing comments you wanna make? No. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all for being part of this. Um, thank you to the first panel and for our all of our listeners online. It's been a really thorough debate. And I, I'm going to end this with the sentiment uh, echoing Vincent's hope that, you know, we can, I before this becomes too partisanly gridlock, we can find that common ground and give businesses the protection they need to reopen in a safe way, assuring customers and their employees that they will be healthy in the process. So thank you all so much for participating and thank you to those who listened online. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.